and welcome to the fifth episode of SciPod. And in case you're wondering, the namesake uh, Tse Wang Sai isn't here because, well, he said he was in a FIFA tournament. Was that what he told you? Uh-huh. Yeah, he said he's in a FIFA tournament and he didn't expect to reach the semifinals. And I told him, I actually did offer, offer him money to throw the game and come here, but he said he'll be a little late. But in the meantime, you can contend with me and our special guest here today. So how are we going to do this? Would you like to introduce yourself? Should I introduce you? Or do we do this weird game where we introduce each other? Uh, I, I, could, uh, I could guess okay. your, your background. You could guess mine. All yeah. right. Now, um, uh, what, how formal do you want me to go? Oh, no, it's, no they, they, there's no formality. Okay, so. that's good. So if anybody knows me, they'll understand the formal part of it. So I'm Sean, uh, Sean Rollins. Uh, I'm a professor here. Uh, and I teach anthropology and a little bit of history. Uh, I'm Australian. You probably can't pick up the accent, though, because Australians tend to think I'm British. But, uh, but um, And I've been around. Uh, before I came here, I was teaching in America for three years and doing some research there, and I wound up in Bhutan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I am your colonial slave. <laughs> well, um, my, my, well the, uh, for those of you who don't know, I am Kilifinso. And I am, <laughs> sorry, but yeah, I've, I've known Sean for a while uh, now and it's been a sort of a running joke whenever I meet him that I call him my colonial master. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make you uncomfortable though? No. Okay, thank God. You um, should be though. Yeah. Well, well, if you ask certain people, they would say that you should be uncomfortable. Well, that's true. It. I mean, part of me should be, but, but the other part of me wouldn't be because I have ancestors who would have been victims of colonialism or of a different kind anyway. So, oh, yes. so um, but that's all right. I mean, we should all front up to our colonial legacies, but mm-hmm. uh, everywhere in the world, you know, colonialism is not just a, a, a white thing. It's uh Let's not stray into controversial topics about <laughs> countries to the south, but <laughs> <laughs> all right. But um, well, you are an anthropologist, so I can yeah. imagine that you could talk on yeah, hours yeah. and hours on that. Yeah. So first question that I have, and this is a question that I've been wanting to ask, but I have asked you this before. But let's just do it for the yeah, sake sure. of other people. A friend of mine once told me that anthropology started from white supremacy. I knew you were going to say that. Yes, I want to. I'm glad you brought it up. It's an interesting one. Um, uh, This is a friend of yours who I teach, I think, right? No, no, no. No? No. Good. Um, (laughs) What if it was, though? Then I'd be worried. I I mean, mind you, I've had some things Mm. that students write in tests as truth, which I know I never taught them. Uh And that bothers me because I think one day they'll go out and uh, tell somebody that the origin of all human life is the Garden of Eden, which I did definitely did not teach them <laughs> and don't believe. Um, but uh, but actually, if it was, I guess I'd just make it clearer the next time. But it's... It's not, though. On yeah. the surface, though, it's actually... It's a valid point, mm-hmm. right? Anthropology... Uh, the anthropology... Um, it came about in an age when European empires are triumphing all over the globe. You know, mm-hmm. Britain... The famous saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire because always at one point the sun is shining on one of their colonial possessions or their homeland. Um, And uh, they also have industrial triumphs, right? And they also perceive that there's something better about their culture, Mm -hmm. which of course is nonsense, but... um, what they think of as the high arts is like, oh, why don't uh, people in Tahiti have that or wherever? Mm -hmm. So quite rationally, to cut them some slack... Many of them stopped and asked, why is it that we appear to be so much better than everybody else? And this is a time when, uh, you know, Darwin's theories of evolution are starting to gain traction. And then this turns into the more sinister social Darwinism uh, and elements like that. Um, and uh, anthropology was very much tied to this kind of natural science in the early days. So anthropologists themselves weren't... Uh, you, to call them white supremacists wouldn't be correct because white supremacists are people who are seeking white supremacy. Mm-hmm. But uh, these people already were in a position where they felt, well, we have this supremacy, right? Uh, and um, of course, they're also laboring under the delusion that they're doing something good for the rest of the human race. Mm-hmm. Is it the savior complex? Yeah, yeah, basically, mm-hmm. yeah. The What Rudyard Kipling in the poem called the white man's burden, right? <laughs> um, and... Uh, so they're trying to explain the world that they're in and they're looking for difference. And many anthropologists actually aren't really interested in solving that question. 
but the people who become interested in their work use it to kind of propagate colonial policies. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, oh, what do these people think and believe? And there's an idea, of course, because of the spread of addictive substances from European capitalist empires like tobacco, alcohol, other drugs like mm -hmm. opium and so on, uh, which is looking like it's depopulating people. Then there's European diseases going to people like in the first contact and they don't have much resistance for it and mm -hmm. that's decimating populations. Like in North America, 90% uh, of the Native American population were wiped out because of disease, mm -hmm. right? Um, so people are looking and thinking, well, why do they seem weaker than us, right? So they start to explore the difference and the scientific reasons for it. And they come to conclusions which, are, which we call axiomatic conclusions. Like an axiom is a fact that's not been tested but is believed to be true. It's accepted nonetheless. Yeah, and nobody has ever bothered to look into is it actually true because if they'd looked into these things, they'd find that actually native populations weren't declining. They were actually slightly increasing. Mm -hmm. Eventually, there was a decline from original first contact, but then also in Australia at this time, for example, by the 1880s and 90s, the Australian Aboriginal population is starting to slowly grow. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, anthropology became one of the many tools that Europeans used in colonial policy to justify their power base. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, you could say, yes, it became a tool of racism for those who were racist. Mm -hmm. um, However, the anthropologists themselves... Well, some totally bought into that. Oh, okay. Um, but of course, I'm sure, I'm sure yeah. there are those, there would be niche groups who would... Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of anthropologists were colonial agents too. They were... Um, working in a colony somewhere and using their position with close contacts with native peoples to investigate them and then write their books. But most actually were deeply uncomfortable about it. Mm. Uh, and um, as the 19th century draws to a close and anthropology starts to shift a little bit from being kind of obsessed with people's physical bodies, tattoos and, and like physical performance of things and very simplistic photography of customs and people um, as some kind of like, almost like a butterfly with a stick Mm -hmm. sticking it to a wall as a curious specimen. Uh, it then shifts uh, towards uh, the 1920s when a Polish man called Bronislaw Malinowski uh, goes to the Trobrian Islands, which is off the coast of New Guinea, during the First World War. So he was, a, he was Polish, but he was associated with Britain, and he's basically the father of modern British anthropology. Mm -hmm. And he makes the argument that essentially the one thing that we're not doing is actually listening to the natives themselves and getting them to speak. And he says that basically the main aim of anthropology should be to tell things from the natives' point of view. Rather than assuming from yeah. your point of view. Yeah, exactly. So early photography was used a lot in anthropology because early anthropologists didn't actually trust anything natives told them. Mm -hmm. right? And they thought, not only didn't they trust them, they believed, oh, they're not capable of translating mm -hmm. their point of view into something that is useful for us, mm -hmm. right? Um, which, of course, is nonsense. Uh, and then people like Malinowski come along and uh, other famous anthropologists and the discipline shifts very much uh, not to say it becomes perfect overnight mm -hmm. and it's certainly not perfect now yeah. right um, but it, it shifts into what do they have to say about themselves <laughs> right what do the natives have to say yeah. about themselves rather than us making assumptions on yeah. what they have to say about themselves right it would be like me hanging around you for a couple of months and I rarely ask you questions. I just watch you and then I write a book and say... Bhutanese uh, all look, seem to look at their phones like this. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Um, or I make really broad assumptions based on just my superficial analysis of you mm -hmm. as a physical specimen. Right. Um, and, uh, or a superficial analysis of your ritual and customs. And I'm not saying that everyone before Malinowski was on the wrong track because there are actually plenty who were actually doing this kind of work early on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, early anthropology was quite close in some sense to archaeology in that it was quite interested in material things mm -hmm. like the things that people produce and and uh, live with and work with right mm -hmm. so they'd be fascinated with this microphone or this table and the way that you interact with it mm -hmm. right and then it's kind of shifted away to more sort of behavioral patterns and ritual beliefs and things um, of course this is like one of those youtube videos of uh, anthropology and oversimplification <laughs> <laughs> But so the main thing here being that anthropology did not start from a place of white supremacy. However, white supremacists used it as an yeah. excuse to further their own. Yeah, yeah. And it's not also, I mean, again, I would say 
there were very few people in the 19th century which I would say are really white supremacists. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one that uh, jumps to mind, which is this guy called uh, Dr. Knox, who is historically famous because mm -hmm. he Did was... Did he have a hard Knox life? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to. He should be. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Burke and Hare um, mm -hmm. murders. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the early days in medicine, the only cadavers you could dissect for instruction were, were for for instruction were criminals, mm -hmm. right? And but there was a thriving grave robbing trade mm -hmm. where freshly buried corpses would be dug up and sold to Dude. professors. Mm -hmm. And there was these two Irish migrants in Edinburgh called Burke and Hare. Mm -hmm. And if, don't, uh, sorry for interrupting. I do remember reading up on a podcast about this, but then uh, you go on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's quite famous. So. They um, were actually murdering people. They murdered 17 people, I think. And uh, they, were, they were operating an inn, right? Was it? Uh, they were it? hanging out an inn. One of them, I think, was married to the inn owner. Yeah. And, yeah. And uh, eventually they killed a girl who everybody recognized. Yeah. But at I think they, school. Used, um, they used to target people who were sort of like vagrants or yes. vagabonds yeah. who were just looking for a place to stay the yeah. night and didn't have any identification papers. Yeah. And then they would sort of like. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And so the professor that they were selling to was this guy, Dr. Robert Knox. Um, and um, I've read quite a lot of his books. It's really interesting from a macabre sense. And mm -hmm. um, he was disgraced. He, uh, Burke and Hare, well, one of them kind of gave King's evidence on the other. They were hanged and because he, you know, rolled on his friend. He was like, mm -hmm. go, but legend has it that an um, angry mob tore his eyes out. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Robert Knox was not charged. Because he was able to say, oh, I didn't know. He was like, <laughs> I these were just these two people who provided me fresh corpses. Yeah, yeah. I didn't ask them for the fresh corpses. <laughs> yeah. They just gave it to me. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, uh, an experienced anatomist can't tell the difference between uh, someone who was dug up from a grave and someone who was murdered not very long ago. Because mm -hmm. um, they strangled them. So yeah. uh, anyway, so he then went and had this career of writing some extremely racist literature. In the 19th century he was an evolutionist before darwin mm -hmm. um and uh he would write about the supremacy of the anglo-saxon people so english people ironic because robert knox himself was scottish so not technically anglo-saxon right um, so he was just an irish hitler he was scottish but A scottish yeah, hitler <laughs> without the power <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and um he would actually write things where it's kind of the destiny of us to um eradicate other races it doesn't matter how it happens um he wasn't advocating that people should be lined up and shot because he believed disease was just going to do the job anyway mm -hmm. um so there were people like him who were what i would call like an early form of a white supremacist but white supremacy as we know it didn't really come until uh the the 20th century you know with like the rise of fascism and mm -hmm. uh, italian fascism nazism and so on and now unfortunately today it's still alive and well yeah, I mean, if for those of you who don't know, if you haven't seen it, then you just have to go on social media. You see it. You see. You see enough videos of it. Like nowadays, like you, you, you can't help but get bombarded by videos of people just being utter and um, <laughs> senseless pricks to other people of yeah. a different color or a yeah. different race. Well, actually, you know, uh, I've heard here a few times, not a lot mm -hmm. of times, mm -hmm. but uh, enough where people have told me, um, "Oh, Hitler was a strong leader," and. I actually have, um, uh, I think I've spoken to you about this, that there are a few Bhutanese who have this weird obsession with Hitler. Mm. My, when I was in high school, my mom told me about this one time when they were having a debate, and some kid said that Hitler was, yes, a very strong leader, mm. and he apparently said that Hitler um, controlled the population. Make of that what you will, but... And there's also been times when I've seen, like, um, the Nazi symbol. Oh, yeah. I've seen a lot of people, like, use it. And I've, I'm not, again, one who goes and tells people don't use it mm. because I believe that's your own freedom of expression. Yeah. But I think a lot of them don't really have the con the co historical context. Yeah, that's but it. Yeah. if they do have it, then it's, yeah. it's quite scary because... Yeah. And it's a little self-defeating because if Hitler was around, he probably wouldn't care that you liked him or not. No, he wouldn't care at all. <laughs> First of all, you're not German enough for him. Uh, you <laughs> don't have blonde hair and you don't have blue eyes. Yeah, um, yeah it's fascinating. But I, I mean, I, I 
the few Bhutanese people who have told me this kind of stuff is a strong leader and I say well what's strong about basically ruining your own country and having it divided in half for a number of decades mm -hmm. and dying carrying in a bunker yeah. <laughs> but um but also uh it's so far removed here geographically and from time from the second world war that I people who say things like that in places like this now you can't judge them too harshly but um It, but, it it yeah. it's there still though yeah but i think it is important to like um like i said there are people who don't have the historical context of it they've just because even our own history books sort of they talk about the second world war but they don't go too much into the horrors that the nazi party yeah, committed yeah. i mean you've got the night of long knives yeah and i think uh, that's the most heinous thing you'd read about in the history textbooks here here oh wow so what about concentration camps yeah. yes that's the thing like it doesn't go into it it doesn't go into auschwitz or dachau uh, the entire like eugenics yeah. and you know jewish women having their even not being allowed to have their hair yeah, yeah. the death holes that people yeah. are just dumped into yeah. so i think a lot of people to them they just see the war aspect of it yeah. and they haven't really gone too deep into what the nazis actually ended yeah. up doing i think also in, and this is partly things like computer games and uh, uh to mm -hmm. blame for this but there's a lot of panzer porn really what panzer porn you know, the, the two tanks humping <laughs> <laughs> if only i'm um, sorry uh, that's the title of this episode panzer, panzer porn. that's a good idea no i mean just like this like oh wow sexy german tank these things were so powerful and you know there's like kind of a mm -hmm. love affair with that sense of german engineering and the fact that the german army at least for a time was mm -hmm. highly effective mm -hmm. um and um you see this uh, where a lot of war gamers are into this yeah. you know um uh, it comes up a lot in computer games and so i think games like wolfenstein and all well yeah all yeah. Games, yeah um Call so of duty and all this stuff. a friend and i used to joke about um uh wearables right as opposed to weeaboos uh -huh. Ooh. Uh, yeah so the wear obviously is this is just named for the german army mm -hmm. um and so if you're really obsessed you're kind of fetishizing that i mean they're cool looking uniforms mm -hmm. and you know very smart appearance and stuff then mm -hmm. i'm sorry but you're a bit of a weeaboo oh okay sorry there's a fly here yeah. who's a special guest we need to find a way yeah. to get it out <laughs> but it's okay um but uh speaking of the panzer tanks um I I don't know if this is historically accurate. So if it is, uh, I always encourage we always encourage our audience that whatever we say here, please definitely go and fact mm. check us because mm. this is just people rambling on, right? Yeah. But uh, so I I remember once my dad got me this um my uh, got me a Panzer tank toy. Do you know which model it was? Like a Tiger tank, a Panther? All I know is that it doesn't have a machine gun on top. I don't know. <laughs> the, 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 the reason is, so an uncle of mine, he looks at it and then he says, you know, this is the reason why they lost in Russia. And then I said, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. So he goes, the Panzer tanks were not meant for, you know, snowy, marshy mm -hmm. weather. And obviously we all know what happened to Hitler in yeah, Russia. Yeah. But the, one of the worst things that happened was, according to why the Panzer, uh, Panzer uh, unit failed, was they didn't have machine guns on top to defend themselves with. So when they got stuck in the muck, they basically were sitting ducks mm. so they didn't even have like german soldiers who could like shoot the machine gun so they were easy targets but that's just what my uncle told me i don't know mm. whether it was historically accurate or the ravings of a madman <laughs> <laughs> i mean he's right about the um the boggy conditions mm -hmm. not so much the winter actually it's when the spring comes along and everything thaws, thaws and yeah. it all turns into slush and mud and that's um tanks are okay at a point because they got wide tracks for mm -hmm. that but the german tanks were particularly heavy because they're massive Mm -hmm. um, but the machine gun thing, I don't think that's true. No, I think, I mean, there are plenty of tanks which, because those are cupola mounted, you can just unscrew them and not, and it's kind of dangerous for mm -hmm. the commander to man it. Um, so it might have been the case that many tankers weren't actually using the machine guns on. But um, I do remember a story from um, uh, about uh, one of the German generals, von Paulus, mm -hmm. who was the commander when they surrendered at Stalingrad. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he ended up spending the rest of the war in prison and was one of the very few who actually survived the Soviet prisons and returned home. But before then, he was in the general staff mm -hmm. and uh, he was very interested in engineering and so on. And mm -hmm. the Germans had knocked out a T-34 tank or its engine had broken down and it was abandoned. It was on the side of the road. So he took out his tape measure and he started to make meticulous measurements and notes. And uh, this was one of the f earliest showings of the T-34 tank. And um, 
he said, if the Russians ever mass produce this, we've lost the war. Um, and the T-34 is a great tank, probably overall the most successful tank design. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean it was particularly strong. It was quite fast. The early ones lacked any radios, so they kind of like hens following a chicken they had to follow the <laughs> tank leader right and um, and all it would take would probably be blow up the first tank to sort of create a sense of discovery <laughs> right. and miscommunication yeah. um, and uh, <clears throat> but it could be mass produced and it had good strong armor and it could mount a powerful gun mm -hmm. and it was not the match of something like a German Tiger tank or a mm -hmm. Panther tank but the Germans could produce those in the numbers that the Soviets could so mm -hmm. yeah We'll talk about fetishizing tanks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but um, so anyway, um, this is history talk now. That's yeah, onto history. <laughs> but I, I love history. Um, I'm not always, uh, like I said, right now factually accurate. But my mom's also a history teacher. And oh right. My mom's an English and a history teacher. Mm. She doesn't teach history anymore. But when she used to teach history, I did love like learning a lot about. Mm. I think like it's always fun to like see these tiny nit like things that a lot of our history textbooks seem to gloss over because they don't consider them mm. very important details. But then yeah. when you look them up later on, you're like, wow, this is like this tiny detail sort of like completely changed the, that time in, the, in that time period. Something completely different could have happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually even remember my school history textbooks and there's so much that's not in them. Mm. And then sometimes there are some statements that are just completely not true. <laughs> could you give an example? Oh, I'm trying to think. Um, It'll probably come to me in like 10 minutes. All right. So when in the meantime, why are you thinking about it? <laughs> confectionery or makeup or something. Um, uh, but, um, uh, and sometimes teachers would say things which they'd heard or read somewhere mm. and the information got muddled and they tell you. Mm. And of course, because it's your teacher, you believe it must be factual. Mm. And it wasn't until I started studying history at university that uh, I realized, oh, well, this is quite true. You know, and you read into better, more detailed books. Mm -hmm. It's more complicated. But when I was doing my uh, PhD, there was one side part of it, not really the main thrust of my argument, but it was an important chapter where I looked at representations of Australian Aboriginals in old school textbooks mm -hmm. from the late 19th century, the early 20th century, up until about the 1930s, I think. And uh, many books didn't mention them at all. Mm -hmm. right? And when they did, it was pretty scant. And it was just like, oh, some Aboriginal people led us to this mountain pass or what, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and or talking about how they were causing trouble. Often there'd be like six pages in a 200 page book, which would mention them and it would be in passing. Uh, and some of those books would also talk about the Maldi people in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And they would always be mentioned in much more detail and the in much more flattering terms than Australian Aboriginal people. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that we have to blame our school textbooks for. Really. History is written by the victors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You Obviously, whoever wrote that book was definitely in the, what was it, the New Zealand Maldi, Maldi people. Maldi people, which, there uh, we go. You probably know the pronunciation, Maori. Bro, Maori? Maori. Maori, okay, yeah. there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I heard Maori. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, talking about teachers, now, uh, how, how long have you been teaching here? Um, halfway through next month, I'll have been here for... Two years. Two years. Mm. And you've been, you said you've been teach. you taught in America for three. For three years, yeah. So one year in Boston and two in New York. Mm. Yeah. And then um, further back in time than that, I also taught in Australia. All right. So what's, what's one of the, what's one of the, like, you've been teaching here for two years now, mm. right, close to two years. And this year would be the first graduating class of anthropologists. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Like the first graduating class of anthropologists. Yeah. So what's, what's something that you've noticed that's very different about the students here compared to where you've been teaching Ooh, previously? I've actually been asked this question by my own students so many times. Um, and This question actually comes from one of your students. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's lots of differences. Mm -hmm. Some of them very superficial, right? But mm -hmm. still kind of interesting. Um, and some of them a little bit more deep set. Um, Those you're comfortable with sharing, of course. Yeah. Because my fresher experience was in America mm -hmm. and I was teaching masters and PhD students there in mm -hmm. the last two years in New York, um, they're a different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. And I probably say this because um, my uh, students from New York won't, uh, may not see this and I'm not going to single anyone out, right? Mm -hmm. There is an element of uh, what I think is kind of an American grad student arrogance. 
Uh-huh. Right, which is that if someone enrolls in the master's program, Good. they're convinced, oh, I must be top dollar material. Mm, right. The superiority thing. Yeah, yeah. and um, many of them are very good. Uh-huh. Some of them, uh, I'm not saying they're bad, mm. but they're not as good as they think they are. Right. Dunning Kruger effect. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> not quite as extreme as the conclusions there, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, generally, if you have a high opinion of yourself, you're probably actually a little bit lower well, than that higher yeah. opinion. Hopefully, not much lower. Um, and they certainly have the capacity to do better, but uh, they're not as open to criticism mm-hmm. as I find students here are. Right. Now, students here. Score one, Bhutan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're not. Uh, students here, for the large part, aren't when they move into uh, a university degree mm-hmm. here aren't as well equipped when they enter it as an American student is mm-hmm. because difference in education system True. obviously and where I teach is a, a western style approach mm-hmm. you know and so to an extent you do need uh, partly a western education to mm-hmm. hit the ground running with mm-hmm. that um, but um excluding those students who are just being lazy and don't care, mm. most actually do want to improve. And if you tell them, don't do that, do this instead, mm. they will actually do it. Mm. But I had experience in America where I'd have the same situation and I'd say, look, it's really important on your final paper you don't draw that conclusion because these are the flaws in it, right? Mm-hmm. What do they do? They dig their heels in and they make the same point. It's like, well, I warned you. <laughs> and, uh, so there is that. And I'm not saying all Americans are like that, but... There are a few. Yeah. And America is a culture where they do actually have to really put themselves out there because it's mm-hmm. so competitive. Mm-hmm. So you can't really... You have to stand un- out. Yeah, yeah, you can't undercut yourself at all. So, And that rolls off into all aspects of your life to a degree. So mm-hmm. even when your professor is telling you that's not correct mm-hmm. because you've done some surface level of research that seems to contradict what your professor says, you decide, well, they're the one that's wrong, not me. Right. right, but the reality is you just got to read deeper and deeper and think about things more deeply. So there are those kinds of differences. Um, I would say. So I've been positive about Brittany students mm. so far. I have to balance that by giving some negatives. Obviously. The compliment sandwich. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I would say actually um, there's not mm. a strong level of critical thinking in Brittany students. I would probably have to agree with that not because because i grew up in that i i studied in that system and i know it took me a very long time to be able to critically analyze and rationalize certain things and right now my mom herself is facing that same issue with high school kids as well yeah and um i i would just hazard a guess obviously because i've not done a study on it but i think it's probably is because of the style of education before Mm -hmm. uh they into higher learning mm-hmm. maybe and it might also be some cultural factors of mm-hmm. being deferential to mm-hmm. uh, established ideas or anything mm-hmm. whereas uh, you know where I'm from Australia and so when I taught in America the idea is what well, critical thinking is first and foremost which is don't accept so in that mm-hmm. sense Americans being um, uh, being critical of things that I might instruct them in class and going in a different direction is a good trait yeah as long as what they're actually saying is true. So, um, and this is not universally true. There are so many of my students who are actually very critical thinkers. Mm-hmm. Um, but you seem naturally. to notice that. Yeah, I do. And there's, and, and of course there's a tendency for, uh, in my discipline for students to say, oh, but what is the answer, sir? And you want to be, because I th- um, that actually comes because, um, if you don't mind me saying this, but like, <sighs> Our education system, like it's it's so reined in mm. because when we were in school, you would actually we had teachers who would get really angry when you corrected them. Like if you knew something yeah. and you corrected them, they would actually get angry. <laughs> and I'm not saying yeah. that's for all the teachers again, yeah. but then, I mean we had that too when I was in school, but yeah. not as much, I guess. But over here, I think it's this, um, especially uh, with you, we 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 are we are born and we are raised with this idea that your teacher is always correct because they are your teachers, mm-hmm. right? And eventually it comes, it, 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 it's, it's to your detriment after a certain point because then you can't, you can't get through your school life without yeah. somebody telling you and giving you the answers. Yeah, yeah, it's, I, I think you're right. That's from my impression. You know more about it than me, obviously. Yeah. But um, there is that sense. And so in anthropology, when I teach, they're actually, they're a very good batch. Mm. Um, and um, both of the 
years. I haven't taught the first years yet, but I've taught the second and third years quite a lot. And they do have the capacity to be quite critical and write very interesting papers. Um, that's not always been my case with other batches at in Bhutan, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, and actually I've taught completely outside of my usual disciplines as well. And uh, the first thing I make sure I tell them is, don't ask me what the answer is, because when you're talking about, oh, I was teaching sociology, for example, mm -hmm. you're talking about sociology. I love Technically, sociology. there aren't really any right answers, just the answers you can prove. Yeah. Right. And that's, obviously, that's an oversimplification. Mm -hmm. But I think it's actually really important for students to think, um, to take a risk and make an argument that other people haven't, even, even if it's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, if you can kind of push the logic and the evidence in a way that, makes a convincing statement that's actually a good strength rather than going through the like dot point of a means b b means c mm -hmm. yeah like again it's i think that's something that a lot of college students um i don't know about the ones uh, who are studying abroad because when i think the whole thing of having to think critically and analytically mm -hmm. came for me personally was when i had to leave and go outside where the education system is a little more different mm -hmm. And also society and communities are a little more different. So you, I mean, India is not that different compared to Bhutan. I mean, mm -hmm. we do s share certain aspects. But when I was in college, my teachers were like, they wouldn't give you the answers. I mean, they would read you notes and they would think, but then they would also be like, um, you know, this part, y'all figure it out on your own. Like, mm -hmm. it, like history, when we were learning history, it was like, this part, I'll only give you all the gist of it. Mm. And then there are books by these these people. There are articles by these people which have a lot of thing into it. Go do that on your own. Mm. And then you'd actually have to go and you'd have to like look for these things. Yeah. Whereas over here, I think it's uh, I think the college. I'm not too sure because I haven't studied in the mm. colleges here. But I think there is a certain level of spoon feeding that students expect yeah. from the teachers. Yeah. And going back to the whole like um, um, you know, not not being able to disagree with your teacher was. When I was in class 12, my history teacher, uh, uh, when I was in class 12, I remember the question in our, in our, in our mid, no, not midterms, in our unit tests. The question was, what do you think was the most important, uh, was the most important contribution made by Shabunga Wang yeah, yeah. So I had written the dual system because we finally had, so I gave my own reasons and yeah. my teacher, my my history teacher, then I forgot who it was, my history teacher actually got mad and told me that it should have been culture. But then my <laughs> argument was, the question says, what yeah. do you think, yeah. which is my perspective. What what they should have written was, what do you think I think? Yes, <laughs> or it, it should have just been, what is the most important contribution? You cannot yeah. write, what do you think? And when the student writes and gives their, because, and then when you do stuff yeah. like that, you stop that, it sort of stops the kid, the student from, you know, like um, mm -hmm. like you said, thinking critically and analyzing their own yeah. Uh, arguments. Yeah, uh, actually, I um, uh, I won't call anyone out by name here, but this is a good example similar to that. Mm -hmm. But I had the opposite reaction. So um, I mostly teach anthropology, but I also sometimes teach history. And this current semester, which is almost over, I taught American history, mm -hmm. and they had to write a final essay. I gave them five or six different questions they could choose from, and one was very simple, which was like. You know, who was the best American president from uh, its early days to 1945? Mm -hmm. And uh, I gave a lecture where I briefly talked about President Andrew Jackson, mm -hmm. um, who has the sobriquet of Indian Killer Jackson, uh -huh. right? So he's not someone I'm at all fond of. And mm -hmm. he ushered in this period of horrible, like, quasi genocide of Native American people, stealing of their land, pushing them into reservations. reservations. Yeah. And so my idea of not a good person, but one student wrote him as this pick. And I was like, oh, okay, that's bold. Picking like maybe my least favorite president. Mm. Um, and they actually devoted a paragraph where they discussed the Indian killer factor. Mm -hmm. And they had all, didn't at all excuse it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, well, this is the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. right? And but their point was actually you can argue it as an example of their greatness because it did have such a high historical impact. Mm -hmm. Which is absolutely true. I mean, you know him now because of yeah. the fact that he killed so many. Yeah. And so, so if I was the kind of teacher that wanted people to think the way I think mm -hmm. and have my own humanitarian instincts, I'm mm -hmm. sure this student also has humanitarian instincts because mm -hmm. they 
were not at all saying that these actions were good, just that they were highly impactful, mm-hmm. right? Um, then I would I would mark it down and say, no, no, he was a monster. You failed. But actually, it was a very good essay. It was compelling. Mm-hmm. It was well argued. And that's what really should be encouraged, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, unless some student writes some nonsense, like who is the greatest uh, humanitarian in history? And they say Chairman Mao or something. <laughs> or Hitler. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, um, um, the I think the education system in the country definitely needs a revamp, and I think with the with the whole um, you know His Majesty having passed the Royal Kasho, mm-hmm. I'm hoping to see. I'm hoping that we'll be pushing it in that direction because right now, even now, I think it's still it's quite scary because it's mm-hmm. more curriculum curriculum based, and it's 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 more to do with grades than it is to do with making sure that you're nurturing a kid who can actually yeah. survive in the real world once they yeah. get pushed out. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. It's about the skills more than anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, anthropology. Mm-hmm. It's defined as the study of human cultures and societies and the evolution and development. Mm-hmm. Now, what thing do you think an anthropologist would study about Bhutan? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Something that's interesting that I think... Because when I was uh, when I was in college, uh, I sort of regret that I didn't take sociology mm. as my subject. Because by the time I had reached the middle of my first semester, they they stopped like allowing mm. us to change, and then that's when I sort of realized that sociology was such an interesting subject. Like, yeah. You know, I love studying about religion, and I love studying about cultures, human, mm. how certain things impact uh, impact people's thinking, as well as how the communities and societies mm. evolve. And uh, maybe one day I could look into that, but I highly doubt I will. <laughs> but yeah, like, what do you what do you think? Like, in terms of an anthropology, and in 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 your anthropology capacity, like something that's like in your own, like as an outsider. What do I think they should, or what they what what you would like to study about Bhutan's society and community? Oh well, you you know because I interviewed for you for my project that I am actually looking into um, a particular issue here. Oh, there's other ideas I have. I'll talk about those briefly uh-huh. too. Um, where I'm particularly interested in kind of Bhutanese entanglements with um, globalization as manifested through the work of artists, mm-hmm. artists defined really broadly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that fascinates me because before I came here I knew about Bhutan from a long long time ago Mm -hmm. uh, reading mostly histories of India and the Raj and so on so Bhutan features usually in a small part of whatever those volume is like a protector of the British Empire or Mm -hmm. you know a buffer state Um, so I knew about it but then when I got the job offer here I realized actually I know very little about it Mm -hmm. really except that it's a Buddhist kingdom and it's in the Himalayas so I looked into it because my first fear was that everybody was vegetarian here. So I looked at the... Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, no I, I looked at the cuisine as the first thing I typed in, Bhutanese cuisine, and I saw, it's, okay, it's all meat, so that's fine. Um, uh, and I looked into other things, and I heard all of the stuff that foreigners typically talk about when they hear about Bhutan. Mm-hmm. Happiest country on earth, and right, uh, traditional, and mm-hmm. so on. So what actually interested me when I came here and started to look around was, okay, yeah, there is obviously all of that cultural heritage and everything, and it's very important to identity mm-hmm. and a part of policy as well, mm-hmm. but there's a very obvious part of that which is engaged with a more contemporary life mm-hmm. in Bhutan. And some people, not anthropologists, thankfully, often would say, like, oh, okay, so Kinley's wearing a cannibal corpse T-shirt. That means he's somehow given up on his own culture or nonsense like that, right? Oh, well, no, I've only... I, uh, not really. I mean, I do want to uh, abort baby. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. just a joke. It's a very dark joke. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Um, but, but of course, uh, these are just kind of trappings of the way that people live. Now, yeah. Right? Um, and dressing as you do right now or us just interacting with like a studio environment doesn't mm-hmm. at all change the fact that this is happening in a very Bhutanese environment mm-hmm. so I'm interested in how do how, how do uh, traditions adapt because well, there's a very good history book by Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger called The Invention of Tradition mm-hmm. and the main argument is that actually when you look at traditions they're very young 
mm. right? And quite often they're promoted as a former state policy, not always, or as like a local community policy to preserve something, but they're often promoting it the instant, not quite the instant, but almost the instant it's introduced and then it becomes a tradition. Um, but any tradition that never changes, that never adapts in any way, mm. will one day die out, right? Uh, so what I'm interested in is how is actually this global connectedness mm -hmm. enhancing local traditions, mm -hmm. right? How are people expressing themselves in old ways but through new things, yes. right? Or in new ways through old things, right? So that's the kind of research that I like to do. Mm. But on, I'm also quite interested um, at the moment in uh, folk research, mm -hmm. uh, not just folk tales, but also urban myths. Right. There must be some, I mean, I've heard a few actually, but there must be some particular Bhutanese urban myths. Which one have you found so interesting so far? Um, I mean, there are quite a few urban myths that we have here. Any in particular that you... <laughs> uh, the, the full details I don't quite remember, but it had to do with a taxi driver stopping by the side of the road. Kind of almost the Phantom Hitchhiker classic, but Is not it the exactly woman that. with the chicken feet? No, I haven't heard that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, this one like that, no, Jamia? Yep. There's something called Japekam, uh -huh. which is literally, um, they believe that, uh, it's, I, the way, the version I heard was the one near Taba, mm -hmm. where they believe that if you travel late at night, you come across a woman who's got uh, chicken feet. And okay. I, I, I don't know, that's all I know about it. I don't know what she does to what you. What happens? Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, she kills you, she takes you to KFC. <laughs> <laughs> No, but yeah, the Phantom Hitchhiker. Yeah, right. so and the, there's others um, because you know uh, cultures actually urban myths are huge in East Asia. Mm -hmm. There's so many Japanese and Korean ones, mm -hmm. and um, because of the Korean influence here, I'm curious as how many of those are kind of translated into uh, as a local tall tale. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in that, and I the separate like folk research projects I'm engaged in. Mm -hmm. um, one, I won't go into too much detail because we're still working on the abstract, mm -hmm. but I'm working with a colleague of mine Ooh, uh, who's an environmental scientist. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to look at a way to kind of merge two completely different thought streams into a theme of conservation. I won't say any more because we, we don't want it to get out there until we submit the abstract. Mm -hmm. But um, there's lots of interesting research that is going on mm -hmm. uh, and there's some which I think is just kind of conforming to foreign stereotypes of mm -hmm. Bhutan like interested in particular things I, I won't name them out because I don't want to yeah. you know it's not fair of me to point yeah, the fingers at, uh, at other researchers like that but uh, that's the kind of typical research that that a foreigner might be interested in doing mm -hmm. here doesn't actually interest me very much mm -hmm. right because enough of that has been done and one of the criticisms of um, non-indigenous people mm -hmm. looking at an indigenous culture is that uh, I could go to some village in the east mm -hmm. and I could spend three years there living among them, making my observations, write a book, right, get it published. Mm -hmm. If anybody there reads it, I will have told them nothing they don't already know. No, true. Right. I mean, I might, I'll put in some theory, which maybe they're not familiar with the theory, but mm -hmm. in terms of their own cultural identity, I've given them nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. So. You've just regurgitated things that they've yeah. already heard. Yeah. And I'm not saying that that kind of work is valueless because mm -hmm. it's about actually communicating that to the non Indigenous as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes it can be useful for them, mm -hmm. for giving them like. Uh, it's useful for cultural heritage, right, okay. uh, to record things. But um, so I'm actually particularly interested in uh, trying to do research that will actually tell people something interesting about themselves. It's like self-discovery. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm actually so 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 you're looking more into the 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 folk aspects of what of the of our society and our community at the moment. Yeah. And there's a third project which um, I have not had the time to get up off the ground, but if you know anything about these and very interested so you know the i think it's pronounced canling the what the canling the uh the shin bones or thigh bones the, uh -huh. yeah. yeah 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 so i'm quite interested in those because um obviously because buddhists practice cremation mm -hmm. those bones are coming from uh christians or muslims right mm -hmm. or maybe an unidentified skeleton found somewhere and then used for uh for ritual purposes yeah. and i'm not First of all, I'm not saying that I have any objection to that necessarily, mm -hmm. but I'm interested in it because it's what 
would often be described historically as a form of grave robbery, right? Well, we've got our own case of Dr. Knox here. Really? I mean, in a way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those they are coming from somewhere. Yeah, so yeah. Unless there's a there's unless there's like a factory in China that's like synthetic producing. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and like people in Har like smuggling it all. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, or maybe the woman with chicken feet has a bag full of them. Yeah, bro, she just her feet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then um, uh, yeah, when you were talking about like, I actually like what you said that in order for culture and tradition to stay, it has to adapt with the times. Yeah, and I think there are um, there is a group of people in this country who are extreme traditionalists, mm. and. Uh, well, uh, my uncle has gotten into the habit of calling them the Shangri-lists yeah. because um, there are a group of them who try really hard to hold on to these really um, to certain aspects of our tradition and culture. But then when you try to hold on to something so tightly, you do end up killing it because you're mm. basically you've got a stranglehold on yeah, it. Exactly. And it's kind of difficult uh, to because there are some of us who are trying to like like uh, there are some musicians and painters and artists mm. who are trying to infuse modern things with our traditional aspects and that sort of and i was saying to me i personally feel that if you want the younger generation to know your tradition and culture you have to give it to them in a way which they will consume it mm. it's like how it's like i would not <laughs> listen to my dad listening to like it, like if he keeps like badgering me and trying to shove it down my throat, I'm obviously not going to um, be uh, accepting of it. Yeah. But then, if you put it in a way, in a way which is digestible and you, that they understand it, then I, I'm very certain that people will go looking for it themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I was just thinking as you're telling me this. You, you know the Pogues, mm. Irish kind of punk folk band from uh -huh. the early '80s, I think it was. He knows the Pogues. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. So you know, so you have Irish folk music, mm -hmm. which uh, was starting to decline somewhat. Mm -hmm. It's still always been kind of popular, but like folk music in general is often it's a niche crowd yeah right? very niche. but you then you find something that's new done with it, which is fusing this folk with punk. Mm -hmm. Suddenly everybody thinks it's cool, yeah. right? So they get into the pogues and then eventually later in life they actually get interested in earlier versions of the folk. Mm -hmm. Right, so which actually the adaptation mm -hmm. can actually suit both crowds. Yeah. You can do something new with it, make it survive, evolve it, always kind of recreate it, mm -hmm. but the original still exists. Yeah. Right, and the main point is not to let the original die out, which yeah. you do by actually sort of um, what's the word here, um, adapting it to what's happening. I think um, one good example is like everyone thought that whiskey in the jar was originally done by Thin Lizzy. Uh, right, and then yeah. you suddenly find out that it was actually done by the Dubliners and it's an old yeah. Irish drinking song. Yeah. So I was like, that's one way because it, it sort of goes into the whole Pogues thing again where yeah. they've taken an old Irish drinking song and then, yeah. then Thin Lizzy does this very classical rock uh, cover of it and then Metallica does a heavier cover of it. Yeah. But then it eventually does lead to people being interested and then finding the old one. And I personally love the older one as well because... Yeah. Uh, although I don't think I'll ever be drink, I'll ever be singing that <laughs> at a at a pub anytime soon. <laughs> Give it a shot. Uh, maybe, but not with that Irish accent. I, if I do it, I want to do it with the Irish accent, but I think it's going to <laughs> it's going to piss off a lot of people. <laughs> There's not that many Irish people here. It's alright. I did meet one. <laughs> oh yeah. A long time ago, I met one at Mojo, and I was so tempted to do the Lucky Charms voice. <laughs> oh God. I know it's so bad, yeah. but then, <laughs> and and I loved, and I think it was kind of funny because uh, we we got to talking. And then he was like, oh, I'm from Ireland. And he didn't have a very strong Irish accent, but mm. you could tell he did have that, uh, the Irish yeah. twang. Yeah. And then he, the first thing he tells me is, don't you dare do the Lucky Charms accent at me. And <laughs> I was like, I was about to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> had, he, had he been warned or did he say, says that to every stranger he I meets? I think he had said that a lot of people that he knew actually tried to do that. Like they did it. Oh, like, um, I I have this other friend who uh, she used to work here and she used to um, basically uh, what's the word here um, where you take old things I can't I can't get the word uh, shit revive there we go she used to revive the thangas mm. and um, and she's Mexican and she told me that when she told somebody she was Mexican he just like blatantly yelled taco in her face. Like he just went and he's like, oh, you're Mexican taco, <laughs> like oh. right into her face. But she got him good because when she was flying back from, she was flying back to Delhi and she saw him on the plane with his wife. So she just walked up to him and yelled, Emma Datsi, <laughs> 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 took her seat. 
<laughs> but I still like the like um I I think uh Although I don't think that a lot of Bhutanese do it out of any... Nah, it's not it's, malicious. It's not malicious. Yeah. But it's also sort of like this, you know, yeah. it's, we don't have the, cul- again, the cultural context. Yeah, that. it doesn't really matter what your intent is if somebody takes offense. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's like how a lot of Australians don't like it if anyone starts talking like Steve Irwin to them. <laughs> because it's like, no, don't... <laughs> yeah. You know what, if not for fucking Americans, uh-huh. that guy would not have been popular. No one in Australia that I knew even watched his show. Really? Yeah. My dad I'm, loves Steve Irwin. It, it's one of those, it's kind of like Crocodile Dundee as well. Mm-hmm. That was popular in Australia, but other things. The better example is Foster's, which Ooh. this is my community service announcement. Mm-hmm. Actually, don't drink it. It's crap. Oh, okay. You're talking about the beer? <laughs> yeah. Um, you will not find a bottle shop in Australia that sells Foster's. You won't find it in pubs or bars. Because it's, it's all being sold here. <laughs> yeah, in the UK and America, but it's it's brilliant advertising because they pretend it's what, what's the tagline? Foster's it's Australian for beer or something. No, you've Some not crap. Anyway, um, but it's really just a drink for foreigners. It's mm-hmm. not very nice. We've got many many better beers than that. Man, and maybe next time when you come back for your holiday, smuggle a few for us. Yeah, yeah. Maybe <laughs> some James Squire. That's a good beer. Oh, uh, so speaking of vacation. Mm. Um, how many, how many, how many, how many weeks are y'all getting for this <laughs> one? And how long of that are you spending grading? Because I have a lot of friends who are uh, uh, professors at RTC, and every time I talk to them, I'm like, ah, it's the vacation. Y'all must be happy. And all of them have just groaned and been like, we have grading. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the grading will be done by the time the vacation starts, technically, uh, but then eventually I'll have to probably put together some new course packs or if I haven't taught a course before, decide oh, what's the structure of it going to be. So part of my week, my week's off is taken up by that. I have a massive total of three weeks holiday. That's more than what the high school students are getting, so. Yeah. I think, I think how much is high school getting, Jimin? Two? Well, Never mind, you know. <laughs> no. It's been... Uh, um, it's been a hard few semesters because of the lockdown. Yeah, the, I can uh, imagine. The workload increases, so a little bit longer would mm. be great, but uh, that's not going to happen. Because it's lockdown sort of also been like a weird vacation studying kind of. sort of situation happening. Yeah. Which my how did how did how did RTC cope with that? Like like y'all do already do a lot of online teaching though, right? It's not like yeah, we were um, before this semester, and there was a plan to. There were all these kinds of contingency plans if we had to do it again, but that that recent lockdown was blink and you'll miss it. Mm. You know, it was so a jokey was lockdown, fine. but it was. Yeah, I think it was a necessary lockdown. There were a lot of people who were like, it was just a false positive, but at the same time, you can never be too careful with well, yeah. with with this new variant that's apparently yeah. way more transmissible than. Yeah, you want to keep, you know, become the boy who cried wolf, basically. <laughs> um, so the lockdowns were okay. The lockdowns, the the longest one obviously happened in my holiday. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> this was like back in. Ju- I think this is the longest holiday. That was in that January, all of January through part of February, wasn't it, or something? Yeah, it was. It was the end of December. So I think we started forty something out. days. Yeah, it was yeah. about forty days. I so, honestly, I didn't mind it that much, mm-hmm. but um, I had research plans in which I couldn't do. Mm-hmm. Um, RTC. You know, for the most part, in its approach to the lockdowns, has done a good job. I think uh, from from uh, I think uh, I had a friend who who was teaching in. I had a few friends who are teaching in certain colleges, and they struggle quite a bit because a lot of them, well, some of them are in far flung places where internet isn't really the most mm. accessible thing, and even if it is, it's not the best quality. So I think I think RTC in that regard did fare a little better than uh, most of the other colleges. Uh, that are strewn across the country but um yeah that 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 lockdown did come about during the longest vacation that rtc actually has isn't it it's like the yeah i mean that's one good thing about being an academic is when you get your like uh mid year vacation which is usually winter in most parts of the world Mm -hmm. uh you get a very nice long vacation in the wind yeah which is good but uh but again you still as an academic you are doing other work you're writing you're researching or you're preparing for the next in your uh, case preparing for your folk project (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, exactly hopefully all right so anyway um uh sai was supposed to show up right jamyang 
I don't know what's happening with Sai. He, he was, must be winning. Well, he did say that he somehow wound up in the semi-final. I like that he said, I somehow wound up in the semi-finals. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how it happened. Yeah. I just wound up in the semi-finals. <laughs> Walked into the wrong building. And... Yeah. Don't we all wish we just wound up in the semi-finals? <laughs> yes, but um, we've been talking for an hour about... Yeah, about 56 minutes. Okay. So, And firstly, it's, it's, it's an, it was nice having you mm-hmm. over for the show. Yeah, nice being here. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, one of before we close that I think I'm gonna I'm gonna try to give you a quite a tough question here. Okay. So a lot of uh, so my sister-in-law happens to be one of your students mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of people say, "What career path does an anthropology student go into?" <laughs> I mean, you could I you could one career path could be the one that you took, which would be to yeah. become a professor yeah. of anthropo- anthropology. Um. That is one. Uh, oh my God! Speak of the devil. Right. He is arrived. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. I mean, I could make the cruel joke, which is back in Australia they used to say if anyone doing a bachelor of arts degree, uh-huh. it's like, what does the law graduate? No, what does the BA student say to the law graduate? Uh-huh. Do you want fries with that? Oh God. <laughs> um, I'm, I take offense to that because I am a beast. Well, so am I. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, but uh, of course, it's you know silly, and there's lots of things that you can do with that. Mm-hmm. But if we want to keep just the idea of career-mindedness for the reason why you get an education, which I think is really problematic, mm-hmm. there's a lot that you can do with anthropology. Obviously, a lot of people here want to go into the civil service, mm-hmm. um, and it's useful for that. They want that safe nine to five. Yeah. Get um, paid at the end of the month. Uh, there are other like major um, like. Uh, like uh, DHI, for example, which they could think of. If they're thinking of going on a more corporate route, mm-hmm. sure. I think, actually, um, people in Bhutan oh, the are really kind of well-positioned to uh, be more ambitious mm-hmm. in terms of academic studies. Now, obviously, not everybody who does a degree wants to go into grad studies, mm-hmm. but even just a master's, which then makes you much more competitive, is good because you have several advantages here. Mm-hmm. There's terms of the way the rest of the world sees you which is every, all anybody knows about Bhutan is it's Asian it's remote and it's happy yeah, it's happy and yeah. it's, it's, especially it's, it's happy. It's happy. yeah but if you want to apply for scholarships right now a lot of Western universities have policies where they prejudice in favor of um, Asian students coming from Asian countries uh-huh. rather than necessarily uh-huh. born in the UK or wherever um, and they'll have an idea that, oh, okay, this is a uh, developing nation, mm-hmm. so therefore you we'll do our good bit by giving them more chance. So actually a Bhutanese student wanting to pursue grad studies at even a place like Oxford or Cambridge um, will get serious consideration if their grades are just decent, mm-hmm. not even brilliant. Charity keys. Sorry, in a way, yeah, I guess. I mean, it, we shouldn't sugarcoat it. It is a, yeah. it is a weird form of charity. Yeah. There's a term in, uh, for third world countries as a better term. I forgot that term. Developing nation. Developing, yeah. developing nation. Mm. Yeah. But there's actually, uh, I, I taught, taught the anthropology development and I said, actually, do we even need any of these terms? There was, a, there was a book that recently published like a list of about five or six different alternative terms for oh. different like tiers because, okay, so America, first world or developed nation, right? Yes. It's got horrible problems. <laughs> And there's massive poverty in the country. Yes. Actually, more miserable poverty in parts of America than you will find here. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. So, yes. in what sense then does development really work as an idea in, mm-hmm. in kind of rating like where is Bhutan really in position with a place like the United States of America? Well, you could say it's, it's not as wealthy, okay. right? Uh, it's not as, uh, there's not as much infrastructure or technology, but mm-hmm. yeah. It doesn't right? Yeah. Okay, oh, so can you guys still mean what I missed? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I come bearing gifts though. It's okay. Still, Nimbani, sponsor us. <laughs> I don't think they even they even know we exist. <laughs> what time did you guys start? We started about an hour ago, and oh, okay. uh, Sean's got an appointment in a while as well. Yes. At five, yeah. yeah. Okay. I can go a little longer. If yeah, we can, can we can we can go a little. Bit okay, longer. so we, what do you guys talk about so you don't be repetitive? Well, we, we we did a little bit of a thing on history, though. I mean, we shouldn't be recapping it for the people. Yeah. <laughs> you recap to me, you know. I can be like uh, a refresher for somebody yeah. tuning in halfway. We were talking about Bhutanese fetishizing Hitler for some reason. What? Whole, <laughs> it's, it's a completely uh, different... Uh, uh. 
You know what? You find out like you find, you find out like everyone else. You listen to the pod. You listen to the pod. <laughs> this is what you get for coming. You for suddenly winding up in the semifinals. Yeah. I I suddenly oh. winded up. I didn't think I'd wind up in the semifinals. Did you win though? No, I, like, my brain was out of sorts. So I lost the semis and just got here. Uh-huh. Yeah. So whatever. Priorities. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I thought yeah. I'll get. I wouldn't go past the group, but then mm-hmm. I got and then so and so on. So um, I, 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 and uh, an interesting thing that. I've been sort of sorry about that. So something that I've been sort of, sort of been getting annoyed by as well as a little fascinated by is, these days we see a lot of the uh, younger like high school kids as well as maybe kids who aren't really, uh, who haven't you know who are in college, yes. they're sort of starting to like this whole globalization thing. It's mm-hmm. it's a natural phenomenon. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. But it's sort of uh, for me it's been kind of crazy because we sort of I feel like, a lot of them are. I don't know if they are. I'm not making accusations here, mm-hmm. but I feel like it's this weird thing of people are emulating what's happening in the West, and I don't know if they're doing it because it's a genuine thing for them. Yeah. Like, like what? What do you mean? You know the whole SJW thing sort of stuff that so happens. Yeah. Woke, woke, woke. Yeah, culture. and I feel like there is an interesting like study yeah. that, you, that that if you like look into why somebody would be doing that. Though I think if it is a genuine thing, it's well and good. But at the same time, I think there are people who are sort of. Um, Blurring the lines between extremists. Yeah, and I, I mean, actually, it's fine. SJW issues are all fine, right? Mm-hmm. Taking part individually, they're worth championing in their own right. But kind of don't do it if you're not also considering the issues in your own backyard. True. I mean, charity does begin from home, and yeah. I think a lot of the time we see, uh, like, I think one one thing that I remember seeing was uh, during this entire Black Lives Mo- Matter movement. Mm-hmm. There were so many people who were like, you know, putting up pictures like Black Lives Matter, putting yeah. But then at the same time, I'm like, we have issues here, and I don't know if any of y'all actually do anything about those issues first. Yeah. But yeah. those issues are in the mainstream, also be more. Like so that's what I'm saying. Is it something that is coming genuinely, or is it something that y'all want to do to be part of the global narrative? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, because it's in the media and it's something people are talking about. So of course you're going to talk about it. So there's that, I guess. Mm. Um, uh, there's probably a small part who are just who are just jumping on board the bandwagon. bandwagon of those because whatever, it gets them chicks or something. I don't know. Um, but, uh, I think it's more like it gets them clicks. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't yeah. know much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's just like that. People tend to agree with the narrative more yeah. so, right? right? I don't know. I'm not, too, yeah. like, I'm not too familiar with that. But I'm sort of, um, but I'm sort of worried about it because what I feel is Today, a lot of children have access to technology and they have a lot of access to information. Mm-hmm. But again, I don't know how they're filtering that information. And when you when you don't filter information, then you tend to have these very screwed up ideas of certain things that could be very harmful to you later on. Mm-hmm. Because I think uh, a lot of children want to be uh, in high school as well with my mom. I, we, we, we've kind of noted that a lot of students tend to want to be treated like how American students are treated, yeah. but they sort of don't know that there are certain responsibilities. Yeah. They want the freedoms of... They want all the benefits. They want the freedoms that... In yeah, the, but then they don't understand the responsibilities that are required of it. And that's what I mean by... They have so much access to information, but they don't know how to filter it out or to un, like to look into the... the what, what would be the word here? The causes of why these people have this. Right. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I, I get what you mean. For some people too, it might just be the first exposure to actually thinking about like social justice in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if it's out there, you, you might think, "Yeah, they're right. That is awful. Black lives do matter, so I'm going to post it, and, and that's fine." But there's some lives here that matter too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, uh, yeah, I guess there is that globalization is like really kind of an inevitable process, mm. and it does change the way that you think and feel about things. Uh, and I guess because I hear from so many Bhutanese people that they want to go and work in Australia or America or yeah. Canada or the something. Bhutanese yeah. The Bhutanese dream. The Bhutanese dream. And so, yeah, yeah, better you than me, honestly. Um, <laughs> but, um, so maybe there is an element of like trying to kind of not ape, but replicate the kind of performance of mm. foreign peoples, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like probably like they, they have that saying dress for the job you want it's sort of like yeah. fight for the cause you want yeah. 
Of course, when I say this, I don't mean to say that those of you who don't genuinely feel yeah, for it are wrong. Yeah, yeah. It's just that I think there are a few of you within that group who are probably doing it just because yeah, you're yeah, not like getting some social clout out of it, like some internet clout. Yeah, I mean, I heard th- this was unfortunately, there's a few instances of people like this I knew over the years. And um, this guy who was living uh, near the university where I was finishing off my PhD and he would occasionally come up and one night he was homosexual, right? Okay. And uh, oh, he was he just like one night he was homosexual. Uh, right, just that one time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I'm sorry. No, uh, so he was, he was homosexual and this one night he came up to okay. have dinner and he obviously was very passionate about issues like gay marriage and stuff okay. and gay rights. Right. And so he's talking about that at length and we're all not along and you know, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, blah, blah, blah. Then I the conversation died down and he asked me about my research and I said, oh, well, yeah, I'm doing this thing, uh, Australian Aboriginal material culture, museums and stuff and the way that uh, it was used by the European population, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, all those Aborigines should be lined up and shot. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as, whatever, I mean, you know, so there is an element where some people will champion a just issue, but they stay, actually we, don't care about anything else. Would you yeah. believe I've had and a similar encounter. This actually happened to a friend of mine, but it happened at an event of mine. Mm-hmm. Okay. So she was, she was um, so I have this event which we, which it's called Annie in the Dark Bhutan, mm-hmm. and it's a charity event where we have it's special guest invites only, mm-hmm. and we basically have a dinner and people donate money so that we can buy equipment and necessities for st- students or children who are living with disability, mm-hmm. especially for those mm, in the East. Okay. So... The requirement is that all guests have to be blindfolded during this event. So, okay. and you don't and you don't sit with the people you come in with. Mm. Mm. So you're placed in different tables. Yeah, you're separated from your friends. Mm-hmm. And then, after the event, she comes up to me. She was really angry, and I was like, "What's wrong?" She's like, "I just got seated. I, like this guy and I, we had such a heated argument about this." And I was like, "Well, what happened?" And then, <laughs> so this guy also happened to be a homosexual. Mm-hmm. What's with all <laughs> Again, not that all homosexuals all are stories, horrible. horrible. Only, it just happens. Only in the middle of the stories we mentioned. By the way, he was a homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> and I think... I got on to it. <laughs> okay, you sing. And he's also... And they're also like very into like the whole, you know, homosexual rights and all that. Yeah. Which I'm all... Gay rights, yeah. I'm yeah, completely sure. for. I mean, everyone yeah. deserves human rights. Everyone deserves to be treated equally. But apparently while they were conversing, um, this person went into this whole tirade against Muslims. Okay. And then again, it's like, like how how do you as a group of people who has understood mm-hmm. yeah. discrimination, yeah. how can you not understand that there are also other, like, just like how not all homosexuals, I mean, not all Muslims are terrorists, not all homosexuals are nice people at the same time, right? There mm-hmm. are a few, there mm-hmm. are these niche groups that sort of define, that sort of become the spokesperson for this entire group of people. And... So it, 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 it's just an event that happened, and and the, the she was really angry about it, <laughs> and she was like, I think they had this really heated debate, and it it sort of thankfully uh, it didn't it wasn't so loud because I didn't notice it, but apparently it was this entire debate like okay. and and it just kind of like you said it's kind of funny that you would ju- like strongly yeah. justify but, one thing. Yeah. And then but if you have like if you if you're well educated to have these kind of opinions why are you like so close minded to happy so like contradicting <laughs> your base of your you know beliefs yeah is there like a like when you study human studies <laughs> is, the, is there like a term for this it's kind common of? it's common it's like really because most people uh, this is oversimplified but most people will care about their own issues of course you know, or I the issues of their it's community it's people are selfish. <laughs> and it's like there's good reasons we actually live like that because we used to live in small communities of villages where there was a fight for survival so of course you only care about your people mm-hmm. right um, and you don't care about taking things from others but of course life has changed um, but there's still an element of that I mean this is actually this is a debate in anthropology and uh, biology in general is human culture dictated by nature or nurture so mm. do we think this way because biology or because this is the environment we've mm. come up in so I think there's uh, most most anthropologists tend to say no it's the environment some have said it is know, it's it's biology but I very few of them say it's nurtured. which is that there's a combination of those factors surely mm-hmm. uh, so so what do you what is your opinion oh I, I think that 
there must be a combination of these factors. Um, I would say. I mean, it's obvious that you would obviously, like you said, you would want to protect the community that you belong mm -hmm. to. And right now, I think uh, identity politics sort of is. And when I say identity politics, I don't mean like in that sense. But again, like we all gravitate towards people who share similar beliefs like yeah. we do or and then you know like we tend to only want to it, it, it doesn't come from a very altruistic thing it's more like a self uh what's the word here um it's more self-catering mm. more than it is towards it and i think it does come a little bit from our like he said it could be a combination of the fact that this is the society and the, the environment that we're brought up in but also something that's yeah. innately biological yeah so yeah, like a combination of things. Mm. Yeah. By the way, I wanted to ask, I don't think if you asked, but then uh, I wanted to ask how Sean came about to Bhutan. Did you ask oh, that? He just stepped onto a plane one day. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, where am I? <laughs> where am I? Oh. Yeah. Bhutan? Yeah. I thought this was Siberia. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was actually, um, so I'd been in America for three years and I went back to Australia for a bit. And I was starting to apply for jobs, and a colleague of mine from America, a Spanish guy, an other anthropologist, um, he just sent me this ad and said, oh, do you want to work in Bhutan for a year? There's an ad in America? No, it was on like a, actually a, a Pacific Anthropology Society, oddly enough, right? Okay. And I said, well, look, I don't know anything about um, Bhutanese anthropology or Himalayan anthropology. So he said, no, no, I think it's more general than that. So I had a look and I emailed uh, one of the staff at uh, ITC mm -hmm. and they told me yeah it's fine like a generalist and like it doesn't matter if your specialty is elsewhere it's fine so I applied and uh, I ended up here and it was the kind of perfect timing really because I was starting to look for a new position at the same time um, I was being headhunted by a uh, like kind of like a talent scout for Chinese universities okay. and um, he uh, you know, he was getting me to do a pitch for it. And so I was considering a position in China. Okay. Um, and even though China would have paid much more, yeah, like three or four times more probably. Yes. Um, at the time I thought, well, look, actually hardly anyone gets the chance to like come here properly except as a tourist. Yes. Right. And those people usually have like money to throw around. Yes. Right. Um, so and I, I never like being a tourist. I like going, I like traveling, but I like to live in the place yeah, for a bit. Yeah. yeah, and so I thought, actually, it's a good opportunity. So I signed a three-year contract. And so how long has it been now? Almost two years. Almost two years, okay. Yeah. So and what do you teach in RTC? Anthropology and history. Anthropology and yeah. history. And so which uh, degree of students? Anthropology. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a bachelor's yeah. this, an this year will be, oh, this year, the first batch of anthropology students will be graduating from RTC. Yeah. Oh, right. cool. And in the country. In the country, actually, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so... What Sean's also not telling you is that there was this Australian Bhutanese exchange program. Okay. For every Bhutanese that goes to Australia, one Australian gets <laughs> <laughs> You took 5,000, we'll bring one. <laughs> Give us one. <laughs> yeah. So... Anthropology. So, like, w what kind of careers do these uh, we, students? Uh, we just sort of discussed. Yeah, just, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, okay. uh, I mean, I mean, there's lots you could do, right? Um, it's really, it actually kind of annoys me because everyone says, "Oh, what job do you get out of that?" That's not it's supposed common, to be the point you. of of well, a higher well, education, well, but uh, of course, we live in the real world yes. and you need a job. It's like you work for government. Um, you could uh, work as a consultant. You could uh, yeah, a professor like you. Yeah, go into individual research also. I assume just yeah. like your own personal brand of research here and there. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. I mean, I know some anthropologists who just went into like business consultancy because, you know, like businesses want somebody who thinks outside the box or some crap like that. Mm -hmm. but, um, so they can do that and they can make good money off it, or they could become a professional academic. So like what me. What made you want to like pursue anthropology? It was a weird chance actually because when I was a university student, I did history. Okay. And then um, I was thinking, after I graduated, I thought, oh, I might um, take six months off and then go and work and teach English in Japan for five years wow. and then come back with the money and fund myself to do a PhD. But I got a call one day just out of the blue from a past professor and she said, there's this um, uh, PhD that has come available and we think you should apply for it. Hmm. And I was like, what's it in? And she said, well, it's uh, kind of archaeology and it's um, Australian Aboriginal museum collections and I 
thought about it for a second and I, I was thinking to myself, yeah, I did a bit of Australian history, but uh, and, and I know Australian Aboriginal history, but I didn't do archaeology, so I don't think I'm capable of doing this. Mm. But then I also thought, this opportunity is not going to come twice. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, all right, send me the details. I applied, I got it. And so my entire kind of career emphasis shifted. Mm. Um, and Historian to... Yeah, to, to basically, in the early days of the PhD, it was like a merger of um, archaeology and history, and then it became like a museum anthropology thing. And then after that, even though I also apply for history jobs too, because I still really love teaching history, um, the ones I always get, uh, basically anthropology jobs <laughs> like two postdocs in uh, museum anthropology and uh, you know teaching jobs of anthropology and archaeology when I was in Boston too um, it just kind of happened mm. you never end up doing the thing that you think you're going to do yeah, yeah. like I was doing say I wanted to be a pilot yeah but that's that's, it, that, that, that's not possible that's poetic <laughs> irony <laughs> <laughs> well I can still be a pilot just that the intercom message would be different, ladies and gentlemen. If you look outside your window on the right, we're about to crash into a plane. <laughs> Please, enjoy Please your, panic. Your, your first and last flight of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sean, what, what have you like um, learned? Any like information you've got about putting these people in this past like two and two years you've been here? Anything like something insightful? You know, like no footnotes. Like, like, if, if like, like imagine you go, you go back to Australia, you go anywhere else. Like, where did you go? I was in Bhutan. They say, okay, tell us about Bhutan. What kind of, how are the people? As an anthropologist, what would your answer be? That's a tough question. Yeah. They like yeah. cheese a lot. Yeah, yeah. Some <laughs> bloody <laughs> reason, and it's so spicy. Yeah. Um, that is a tough question. They drink Fosters for some reason. Don't, don't hold back. <laughs> Why the fuck do they drink Fosters? Yeah. We don't drink Fosters anymore. We used to. But anyways. You can still find it in the bars, unfortunately. Really? Yeah. I don't think anyone orders it, though. Good. <laughs> but why? Okay, we'll, we'll go to that into a bit. But then, like, yeah. uh, so what, what? What would your answer? Like, what kind of thing about putting these people? Uh, I was, I'm always curious to ask foreigners who come in, especially like, to ask a person like you, who's you know, yeah, knowledge in anthropology and who's lived here. You know, the first thing that's going to me is unfortunately negative. But I don't want you to think that but it's I, okay. I have a negative it's okay. evaluation. There's no filter. This is the side part. Yeah. We have no filter. <laughs> Could we take a uh, guess? Actually, let's make it a little. Okay, go on. We're super our, lazy and bureaucracy. Our, our sense of time. <laughs> so, no, it's not that, but that's a good point. Because in, like, one thing that I've, uh, I've spoken to a few, uh, few foreigners here, and they all say, y'all are really careless with your time management. BSD, but unstretchable time. <laughs> that's, that's, the word. that's good. So, um, that bureaucracy is a good yeah. point, actually, because that is a... That is an issue here, without a doubt. But um, I would say, and it's not true of everyone, but there's many people, mm -hmm. um, particularly younger people here, I think have a pretty profound lack of confidence. Ah, uh, that's, a, that's a good insight. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah our uh, king has mentioned that as well, that most of our um, the youths are kind of lacking skills and lacking the confidence to pursue anything they don't have. Yeah. They don't know what they, what they want to do. Yeah. And I think this Desung program is kind of helping everyone. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so that's, I've thought about that many times. Uh, at first I thought it was just politeness, you know, everybody like polite. calling me sir or like giving me special treatment just mm -hmm. because I'm not from around here, right? Okay. Um, but then I started to notice that it, it runs a bit deeper than that. And there's obviously huge exceptions. Okay. Uh, but um, generally, yeah, and this is this is unfortunately true of many countries in the so-called developing world, right? Yes. Because there are people who don't have as many opportunities, say, um, so they tend to think, well, why bother, mm -hmm. right? And then this kind of breeds a sort of a lower self-esteem, mm -hmm. um, which um, you know one anthropologist called the the politics of poverty, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's maybe partly the reason why for some people. But, you know, there's people here doing very well. Yes. Uh, and there's plenty of young people with lots of ambitions. Mm. And actually, it's not just talk. They're actually doing things to, mm. yeah. to move through the ambitions. But that's one thing that's always struck me off and on. And there's lots of positives that struck me too. But yes. when you asked that question, that was the first thing that came to my okay. mind. So, yeah, I don't, know. I don't mean to offend anyone, but I'm just being honest. I don't think okay. that's. that's not really, I don't think that's very offensive. Really I think a lot of Bhutanese we do tend to have a very, it's a very, very, um, 
docile nature towards people as well. We are very accommodating would be the word, I think, to yeah. a certain extent. <laughs> and we don't, again, like, we, again, it goes back to the whole, like, when we were kids, we don't have the thing to question people. And yeah. Yeah. We don't have, so it's sort of like... But I think it's exception for you and I know you and... Oh no! For me, it it, it only came out when I was in college. Oh really? Because when I was when I was going through oh, really? high school and stuff, I would not pipe up so much with really? people. I would pipe up with my friends, but anyone else, not really. Hmm. I was the kind of non-confrontational. I, I'm still non-confrontational. Okay. Although I don't know what you mean by confrontational in what aspect, but. No, if like someone like you know, like maybe insults your intelligence or something like that, oh, no, no, no. You think, I, you I would, bad. I would, why would I want to argue with someone who's insulting my intelligence? <laughs> just I've already won the argument by not, <laughs> by not confronting them I about mean, it. So basically, yeah. So then, uh, anyways, yeah, Foster. So one question I always I want to ask an Australian person is, why do Australian people don't like Foster? It's made of kangaroo piss. Because <laughs> <laughs> it tastes like garbage. I, I don't really recall it because I have no. I, I don't think I've had Foster's myself, so I'm not sure. It's inferior to the other most of the beers. locally produced beers. I mean, it's like anywhere, right? Like the craft beers are always the more interesting ones, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And in Australia at the moment, craft beers really like took off. Okay. Um, but there are some good like uh, mass-produced beers too, and Foster's is not one of them. But why is Foster very like very popular? They just brilliant advertising campaign. They pushed <laughs> it overseas, and like that's their target because you don't. No one buys it in Australia. You can't. It's actually hard to find it to buy. Well, because it's not popular. <laughs> yeah. What happens to that one Australian dude who says he wants to drink Foster's? I think you gotta like gather around him and give him a good beating. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Beat the devil out of him. <laughs> <laughs> he's yeah. possessed. Throwing some stingrays. Are you even Australian? He's from he's from New Zealand. That's, so that's what happened to <laughs> Steve Irwin. Oh, yeah. He liked Foster's. Yeah, you yeah, threw yeah. him to the. Oh, we should, uh, I'm probably. so sorry. That's a joke. <laughs> dark, dark joke. <laughs> So what's, what, what's your favorite beer here in Bhutan? Here? In Bhutan, sorry. Um, uh, you don't have many options. No, yeah, but they're, they're, they're all pretty Okay, right now technically, yeah, we do, we do. They're all, they're all kind of good. The only one that I don't really like is when Red Panda is in a can or in a bottle. I've never seen in a can. No, in a bottle, I mean. Oh, you know, And that's because the sediment is never mixed properly. But when it comes out of a tap, it's quite nice. I actually oh. I actually do like Red Panda when it comes out of a tap more than I... That's why the yeah. first time I drank Red Panda, it was in a in the bottle and I remember I said I do not like this I do yeah. not want it and then the next time I drank it I was like I didn't even know it was Red Panda and I was just drinking it out of a mug and then my friend's like don't you hate Red Panda I said, this is Red Panda it's like yeah it's from the tap and I was like okay so there's a difference here yeah, between yeah. the tap and the yeah. oh I did not know that you see it's because with those sediment beers right Yes. you're supposed to like turn them and turn them and turn them like this yeah. before you even open it but the problem is if you get one here they'll just bring it to your table and this is Great. This. Maybe you can tell them like I'll open it myself. Then maybe you can yeah. do the whole thing. But it has a taste of like have you had whole garden before? Yeah. It's kinda of similar I feel. Yeah. Red panda. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. a taste of that. But I like amber eel. Yeah, amber eel is probably the best. Actually, actually no, my it's favorite was, popular as well. was um Dragon Frost, but I can't find that anywhere anymore. Dragon Stump or Dragon, Dragon Frost. Dragon Frost. No, there was one called Dragon Frost. Yeah. Yeah. It's I like a blue it. can. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. There was one called Thunder 15,000 yeah. as well. Now, I don't know whether you get that. Yeah, I think it's still around. I think, I'm not sure. There's Chup Chu also. I think Chup Chu and Dragon Frost are the same company, if I'm not mistaken. I think it is. I, they are, but I, I think s- they are I saw a new company. one last night. I don't know if it's Bhutanese. It's called Three Pots. Wow. I don't know. I never heard of it. Oh, it's quite nice. It's a lager. Mm. It's fairly light, but it's still good. Flavorful. It just had, what was it, like, the essence of the Himalayas or something. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> the tagline. Tag, tag, like, yeah. the essence. Well, probably is Bhutanese, yeah. Yeah. maybe it is. Yeah. I feel compelled to say right now, for our viewers, alcohol is injurious to health. Because <laughs> that's the rule that, like, not the rule, but remember when we were shooting Get yeah, a Baby yeah. and, like, during the sketch mm-hmm. comedy that we've been making. Uh, so, <laughs> disclaimer. as soon as there's a scene <laughs> yeah. where some of my cast members are drinking wine, and then they were, like, the people who were watching it were like, we need you to put alcohol is injurious oh, to health on this. I was like, yeah, we'll put it, but it's not going to stop people who want to drink from drinking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in India, it's banned in, on any advertisement of alcohol. You know that? Any advertisement of alcohol. That's why Kingfisher, when they advertise their brand, they advertise like a lifestyle, they advertise like soda. But Kingfisher is m- more... It's more a beer. Like, it's known as for a beer. It's a bad uh, beer. So they, they try to market it as like a lifestyle, you know, like Kingfisher, we have sodas, everything. But in, mainly it's, it's the alcohol. Aren't they bankrupt now? Um, that dude, I watched a documentary on Netflix. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Billionaire Bad Boy. Yeah. It's pretty good. Um, so basically, yeah, I think he 
He made some bad financial investments, especially in his Kingfish Airlines. Airlines, yeah. And he messed yeah. up over there, so he lost a lot of money. Yeah. But it's still very, very popular. Yeah, and still richer than us, so. Yeah. <laughs> no, these people have more money than they, they can ever spend in their whole lifetime. So mm-hmm. they decide to like, you know, blow it up. Yeah. But then like, I think I read this last, last time somewhere that um, there's a number where if you go greater than that number in terms of income or like uh, savings, then you will not get more happier. I think that number is like $100,000. If you have $100,000, you can buy anything which will make you genuinely happy. Mm-hmm. And anything more than $100,000 is not going to make you, you ha- happier, you know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't buy a castle with 100000 but I don't really need a castle. Yeah, I don't think. You don't really need a castle. It depends on where you're going to buy the castle. With a ruin? <laughs> I mean, uh, if you if you go to a country where the, the value of a dollar is quite a lot, yeah. then for 100000 I'm sure you could buy a castle. No, but would a house, a nice house, wherever it may be, yeah. be compared to a castle, would you be much more happier, exceptionally happier, living in a castle than compared to a nice, you know, like a bungalow? I think I prefer the castle. You prefer the castle. Okay. Oh, wait. Uh, the first time I met Sean, speaking because we we're talking about really weird hypotheticals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about hypotheticals. The, this, yeah, the first time I met you, you told me on hypothetical. Oh, yeah. What was it? Uh, something to do with if you're on a deserted island and you had to cannibalize someone. <laughs> yeah. I can't I think, remember the details. I remember. So, um, you're on a deserted island, right? Okay. And you've got one fridge. One fridge? Just one fridge on that island. Okay. And it can only store, like... Not much storage space. Okay. Now you can choose another person to be on that island with you, okay. but they're basically your food source. Okay. So you have to cannibalize. Okay. So, which so logically speaking, you pick which a fat person, which huh? race? Not even body type. It's more like which ethnicity of people would no, you? No, I'm sure it was the body type. Was, was it? it body? No. Yeah, because because I, I know because he's said the, he's just said the wrong answer. It's the wrong answer. Because yeah. everybody says it should be a fat person, yes. but oh. actually no, it should be someone like uh, okay. like Shaq. A tall dude, lean. yeah, like a Big very lean. well built, yeah, very, very well built, yeah. lean person. Yeah, why did I? Oh, it's I, oh, shit. I was the one who took it, but Shaq is <laughs> kind of somewhat <laughs> overweight, but maybe not his BMI because he's so tall. Yeah, but you want and you don't want someone who's too, you don't want the rock because that's just old meat. You're gonna have too to slow cook lean, that yeah. for like two days. <laughs> <laughs> Over so someone rock. with a good balance of fat. Yeah, like and f- f- Bruce Lee. Oh, so like, like a cow who has that kind of build of like Shaq would have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bruce Lee, he's too lean. Bruce Lee, you, you, you probably see probably, all his bones. Yeah, by just bones by now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we are talking hypothetically, and yeah. he, in my hypothetical mind, he's oh, okay. alive. Yeah, okay. He's always alive. Okay. <laughs> you never die. In my dreams. Mm. So, Shaq. Okay. Yeah. Any, any more other hypotheticals you have? I uh, know, that was the only hypothetical I think we really we oh, Just one question uh, about uh, human psychology, one thing about, like, for, it's about a dilemma, it's about the. Um, what's that? Like to be a nice person kind of dilemma. Like so, okay, here's a this three part question. So there's a train, okay, the train is coming at whatever speed, and then there's a person on the tracks, okay, and then oh, if you, and you know, five people on the other track. No, 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 no. The first question is, um, like a train is coming, okay, and then would you? It's a social dilemma. So would you? There's a lever, okay, and if you press that lever, it'll change the track and avoid the person, and the person won't die, yeah. okay. Got it? Yes. Okay. So I know the oh, social experiment. Oh, you know. So the first thing is, what would you do? You press this lever, right? Obviously, right? Yeah. But now in this next scenario, if you press the lever, uh, the lever it'll mm-hmm. go to another dead end and then all the people in the train will die. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? How many people are there in the train? Though? Like, let's say 50%, hypothetically. Mm-hmm. I would still kill the one person. Okay. Because if you kill the one person, you could argue that you're not involved, but of course you're making the choice not to do anything. Yes. Mm-hmm. So my response is, I would divert the train so everybody on the train dies and then I'd cross over the tracks and kill the one person. Because that one person has yeah. no business lying on the train. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, no um, uh, it's, it's a tough one. It's, they call it the trolley experiment, I think. Because okay. um, uh, it's really just about just the... Uh, Social dilemma. Moral dilemma. Yeah. Moral, moral dilemma. Um, and, uh, and justify the means kind of thing. Okay. Um, I would let the one person die if I had to absolutely choose. Okay. Now, in this third scenario, that one person on the train is uh, someone you love. Let's say in this scenario, it's your mother. Mm. That's the person in the train tracks. Now, now what do you do? 
wonder why the hell is my mom standing on a train track? Okay, in this hypothetical situation, <laughs> she loves train tracks for some bloody reason, and she has a whole bunch of magnets in her, in her, yeah, yeah. In her pants, and she just stuck on the train. Why does she love train tracks? <laughs> and she loves magnets, okay, in this hypothetical situation. Okay. okay. Okay, she loves a lot of magnets. I don't know my mother anymore. <laughs> <laughs> she's got like 50 magnets in her left pocket and she's stuck on the train. Okay, now, Kinle, what do you do now? Mm, shit. <laughs> uh, I shoot myself. You shoot? There's no gun. No, no, I, I find a way to kill myself. Your, hand is, super glued. In front of the Your hand is super glued to the lever, okay? Then I smash my body into the lever and, and you can cuss myself. And, and you are, you are on p- p- paralysis, except your... Um, no, in accident. all honesty, like, I don't know what I would do in that situation. Because that is I, a social I, dilemma. Yeah. No, because I am not in that situation. Yeah, but hypothetically, no, you would not know. Now, if, do. see, if it was not my mother, happily, that one person's dying. People. Because I have to make for me it's the lives the of good. the great the, the lives of the many out so not that always but in this situation it does this one person's death is going to save the lives of so many others mm-hmm. that isn't the case all the time but in this case it is but if it's my mother I honestly don't know what to do mm-hmm. but if you don't react mm. your mother will die die anyway right yeah that's the, that's the thing mm. if you don't react. But you also not have like a direct correlation, but you might have the uh, regret, remorse that you did not act when you could have. I think I'd still have to go with the first one then. Yeah. You still let the mom, mom go? Because my mom is, has lived a good chunk of her life. Okay. The people on the train probably... Let's see, your unborn idea. child is there. How the hell is an unborn <laughs> child on the train track? Now, with a snap of fingers, <laughs> my hypothetical universe... Then that's already a dead kid because it's not born. Your unborn <laughs> child, okay, let's call him um, Kinney Jr., okay? He's got, a, he's, got, he's got a mohawk, okay, purple hair, okay? He's got three piercings because he likes punk rock just I'm, like his I'm, father. I'm, I'm okay. still running over but the kid. But for some bloody reason, I'm, he has no, 50 I'm, magnets as well. No, I'm still running over the kid because he dyed his hair purple. Okay, so Sean, we'll... Well, what are your thought process at this be? Uh, with process. the mother situation? Yes. Um, save my mother. Save my mom. Fifty percent of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At least you're oh, honest. Fuck him, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least you're honest. But you're gonna die along with it. No, you don't die. Alone. No, I'm not on the train. You just, you oh, just, you're not on the train. For some to... reason, I'm standing next to a lever in the middle of a train. Track. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Right now, the whole time I've been thinking I'm on the train. You're on the train. Yes, for some reason I've been thinking I'm on Why the train. Why do you think you are? I said you have a lever. Because there is this other trolley experiment yeah, where you are on the train. Oh. And that's why my brain immediately went to that one. Okay. But I would still... I don't know. I, I, Run away your mom. Yeah. Okay. But then this hypothetical... Because I know for a fact that she would understand as yeah. well. Yeah. Th- even for me. Like I told this question to my mom and she said, you know, kill me. Because you know, why won't you want to save... Let, let 50 people die just for me. But my mom, my mom's all about it, you know. <laughs> but suddenly it's a real time situation. Fuck those 50 fuck people! Pull the lever! Pull the fucking lever! Who's fucking with you? Why are you standing there? Don't you drink nothing? I carry I said, Mom, why do you have 50 <laughs> magnets in your pocket? Who told you to buy 50 magnets? <laughs> that was on sale at Walmart. 811 <laughs> had a great discount. 811 had a great discount. I think with that, uh, Sean's getting late for his appointment. Okay. Yeah. I and mean, I right. think with that, I'd like to share one last thing. Yes. What's the difference between an orphan and an apple? Oh God, what? Right. Apples get picked. <laughs> <laughs> I got another one. I think I told you this one. Uh, what did the blind and deaf and uh, armless uh, orphan get for Christmas? What? Cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've, I've heard a variant. Of okay, that. with that, okay. With, with all horrible dark <laughs> jokes aside. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, since uh, Kina got into the intro, I to the outro. So I want to thank Sean for coming in. You're welcome. I, 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 I appreciate you coming with your busy schedule. I don't know if you do have, but um, regardless, thank you for coming in. And uh, I'd like to thank Jamming also for setting it up. Look, man, we got we're upgrading, man. We got some green screen shit going on. Right now, if I kick my. F- I want you to put a kite just because we can. Okay, just put a kite. And now it's Mia Khalifa. Okay. No, what? No, stop, stop. Censor. <laughs> okay. No, not in that thing. Just okay. Mia Khalifa. Okay. Okay. And. Uh, uh, what do you want on the green screen? On the green screen? Foster's beer. Foster's beer. <laughs> <laughs> you you better, better not mess it up, okay? Now back to normal. Okay, and uh, so anything you want to say, Sean? Past and parting words? Anything you, you want to know people to know about you? Anything you want to tell if people are watching this? Something you have online or something? Uh, I, don't want any, I don't have any social messages. Yes. I've been giving that to my graduating students too much lately. So. Okay. Um, but I uh, guess just thank you for having me. Uh, it's been it nice. Fun. It's been interesting. Thank you. And... Uh, 
next time, I guess. Yes, please. Yeah. We hope to have you again on the future. And with that being said, this is the end. And bye, guys. Oh, yeah. by the way, sorry. Follow us. <laughs> follow, subscribe to Juno. Subscribe to our um, um, other YouTube channels and follow us on Instagram if you can. With that being said, thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks. Yeah, thank thanks. 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 Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. I'm, I'm yeah. so sorry. I had. Uh, I did not know that uh, I was that good at FIFA. I don't know. Just, yeah. <laughs> just we had a nice. We had a long, rather rambling talk about yeah. white supremacy. White supremacy. <laughs> and then 